All right, fantastic. Well, it's 11 o'clock. I'm going to get started now because um, there's very busy people here. And thank you to all of you who are here already. We're expecting lots more people to join us. Um, this is a, a very difficult time uh, for the NHS and for the doctors within our network. And we're running this uh, briefing today to let you know what is happening in the NHS at the moment and what we think needs to be done to improve things for patients and for also for staff who are having an extremely difficult time. Um, we are every doctor, a lot of you know us already, we're a doctor-led campaigning organisation. We speak to about 400,000 people every day who are supporters of the NHS. Some of them are NHS staff and some of them are not. Um, we're all extremely concerned about what's going on. Um, we have a network of about 25,000 UK doctors um, from whom we gather testimony and we offer support services to those as well. So we hear an awful lot of information daily about what's happening. Um, we actually had to really scratch our heads um, in autumn this year about what could be done this winter to improve things because things have got so dreadful. And I'm sure that you're seeing the headlines um, every month that the waiting lists are getting worse. The ambulance times are really scary. We're missing an awful lot of staff. Um, the situation is not homogenous across the UK, but there are problems in each nation. Um, and it's time to think about whatever it is we can do to make things safer this winter. So we've put a lot of thought into that and we've created a list of five things that the government must do in policy terms to think, make things safer. Um, these are not long term solutions. There are lots of longer term solutions which need to be considered. These are simply things that would make the service a bit safer this winter. And it largely comes down to the workforce. We are missing so many staff right now that patients are not flowing safely through the system. And there is an enormous amount of pressure on the staff remaining. We are hearing from lots of staff members who are going off sick with stress or just becoming sick um, with illnesses because of the pressure that's being loaded on them. And there's some solutions to some of these problems which are quite easy to implement and yet the government aren't doing them yet. Now I'm just going to say at the outset of this presentation, our aim is to work with as many parliamentarians as we can across all political parties to put pressure on the government to change things. And we want to assist in any way we can, um, whether that's writing letters, writing questions, um, providing extra briefings, whatever it is you need, this is desperate. Um, as you know, a lot of you have known us for a couple of years now. We're doctors, we're doing this out of duty. We're horrified. It's, it's horrifying what we're hearing and it can't continue like this. This wasn't what the NHS was set up to do. We're not providing safe care. It's horrible to say that, but that's the truth. Um, and we need to face up to it. I can just see that, um, I'm just gonna find out, are people hearing me okay? Because I've just seen that um, that Sir Roger Gales said he's not. I can hear you fine, Julia. There's, a, there's an echo on the line, which means that some microphones are probably open. Fabulous, okay, thank you so much for telling us. Could everybody who's not speaking turn themselves onto mute, please? Sorry, I should have said this at the outset. If you have questions for us, we would absolutely love them. Pop them into the chat box and we'll answer them at the end, guys. Okay, fabulous. So let's get going. We've got three frontline doctors joining us today. I'm gonna to whiz through some information. Some of it you might already know, so I'll go through it quickly. So here's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to talk probably for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, I'm gonna give an overview of what's going on. And then we're going to hear from three frontline senior doctors about what's happening, where they are, and why they're concerned. And then we'll go to a Q&A session. Um, this session, just for anyone who's just joined, is currently being live streamed on our Facebook page. So members of the public will be watching it. Um, and But any questions that you have that you maybe don't feel comfortable asking in this forum, please just send us an email. We'll be happy to have a private conversation with you. I know that some of these things are difficult to talk about. OK, so we are facing the worst winter crisis ever. And I think sometimes we can all become a bit desensitized to it because every single winter we're saying that it does get worse and worse and worse. Things are really scary now and people aren't safe. Um, as I've said, there are five short term policies we have come up with that we think the government could put in place. Mostly it's to bolster the NHS workforce. 
Can I have the next slide, please, Hannah? Okay, so we're going to break it down a little bit into the different nations. Obviously, healthcare is a devolved issue. However, we also think there is a lot of room for collaboration and the problems are going on all over the UK. England is the worst at the moment. We've got over 7 million people waiting on a waiting list at the moment. Um, that in itself just seems like an enormous number and it's quite difficult to kind of quantify. But those people are struggling, in pain, suffering, and it's placing an enormous burden on our primary care services because most of those people are waiting for hospital specialist input. And meanwhile, GPs are tasked with providing care, which becomes more and more difficult as people's clinical concerns get greater, the longer they're waiting for treatment, things develop and get more serious. It's really, really fraught situation at the moment. We've got a terrible situation with ambulances, with more than 10,000 ambulances a week, it says here, wait, waiting over an hour outside the A&E departments in England. And um, A&E waiting times are absolutely terrible as well. Now I'm just gonna explain quickly why the problems are happening with the ambulances and A&E. Some of you might know this, I'm really sorry if this comes across as condescending or patronising. Basically, when you get patients going to an NHS hospital, there's a flow through the system. So an ambulance turns up, they need to drop a patient off in A&E. The patient might then need to get admitted and spend time on a hospital ward and then they'll go home. And they might go home to their own home and get some care there or you know live independently or they might need to go into a different facility for social care or ongoing um, clinical needs now at the moment we have enormous problem in the social care sector so patients are being delayed in being discharged from hospital because for lots of patients there's nowhere for them to go that's creating a backlog so there's therefore less hospital beds for the A&E department to admit new patients into so the A&E department gets really clogged up and the ambulances going back further are unable to drop patients off because the A&E departments are so backed up. So the whole thing is backed up at the moment um, because there's ambulances waiting outside A&E departments. There's less ambulances going around on the roads. And so people are waiting longer for an ambulance to pick them up. Now, that's an extremely simplified version of what is going on but broadly that is happening all over the country at the moment um, and people as a result are having worse care um, some conditions in A&E you're okay waiting for a long time before you're seen and your you know your condition won't deteriorate but there are a lot of things where we've worked out what the gold standard of care is and you need to have treatment within a particular time frame in order to have a good outcome we're failing on a lot of those time metrics now and it's impacting people's health. In lots of cases, it's causing people to deteriorate and we're hearing about patients who are dying as a result of this. Lots of people dying whilst waiting treatment, either at home waiting for an ambulance or dying while waiting to be seen. Um, it, it's really terrifying. It's horrifying. It shouldn't be happening. Um, for the first time, I was told last week about a junior doctor who was being trained to look after patients in an ambulance um, because their trust has just accepted that that's the way it's going to be for the time being. So they've bought an old ambulance and stuck it in their car park and they're training the juniors into how to deliver care there, which is just seems like a sort of Kafkaesque situation we're facing now. All right, Hannah, could you put the next Okay, so in Scotland, <laughs> I hope that I've, I'm answering this question now that's just popped up in the chat box. So in Scotland, um, we're noticing the waiting times going up in emergency departments. And Maria, who's um, one of the doctors in our team, is going to explain a bit about what, what things feel like in Scot Scottish hospitals at the moment. Um, it's getting a lot worse in Scotland. It's not quite as bad as England in terms of the pressures on the emergency services at the moment. Could you flick onto the next slide, please, Hannah? Thank you. So in Wales, um, here's just an example of the minutiae of what happens when the ambulances get backed up. So there are guidelines about how quickly an ambulance has to respond to certain conditions, and they fall into four different categories, depending on the clinical need of the patient. Um, when you're in a category one or a category two, which are the most pressing need for a clinical intervention, um, every second counts. And so when you're looking at this, um, a red call is something that's urgent. 
Um, and you see that the, you know, the increase in time has gone up from nine minutes, 43 seconds to 10 minutes, two seconds. You might think, well, that's really minor. Why are these guys making a big deal about it? If you're um, incredibly unwell, and you have a life-threatening situation, every second counts. And we need to be drilling those um, numbers down as low as we possibly can. Um, and so any increase, it makes a big difference to patients. Um, and we can see at the bottom here that even Wales has 590,000 on a, on a waiting list in September. Um, Wales obviously has a much smaller population than England, so you can't compare like for like, that is a lot of people waiting. Um, and in Northern Ireland, this is truly horrifying, actually. Um, so the, the gold standard within an A&E department is that patients are seen and either admitted to hospital or discharged within four hours. And the target for that is that 95% of people will fall into that four hour target. Now, when I worked in A&E 10 years ago, that was basically what we were doing. Sometimes we'd fall a bit short of it and we would feel appalling as a result, but it, you know, it used to be doable and it provides really good care for people. In Northern Ireland in September, only 51.4% of patients are fitting into that. Now that's terrible. That means that patients are either waiting a really, really long time in the waiting room or they're waiting in the department having received some care, but haven't been fully, you know, um, cared for and, so there's a lot of waiting around. There's a lot of people deteriorating. It's a terrible situation and it, it really shouldn't be like that in the NHS. We, we, we know that we can do better than this. Um, OK, could you move on, please, Hannah? OK, so when we try and think of solutions, because that is what we're trying to think of, the biggest part of this problem right now is the staffing crisis. A lot of you have been incredibly engaged with us throughout the pandemic and you know the stress that NHS staff have endured over the last couple of years. There are lots and lots of people leaving the NHS because their jobs are really stressful at the moment. Um, England is missing almost 10% of all staff. Um, also the staff are being underpaid. We've got a situation where lots of staff are taking strike action in December. This is only going to sort of squeeze the staffing further. Now, I don't blame any of the people who've decided to go on strike, but when we think about the workforce and patients, we also need to think about safety. What can we do in the short term that is gonna keep patients safe? And we need to support those staff. So, Hannah, could you come onto our list of things? Okay, so we've created this list of things that need to be done. We need to stop expecting that staff are gonna just endlessly absorb all of this pressure because staff are humans and they're workers and some of them are leaving. Um, even if, and I think some, you know, even if you have no sympathy for people on an individual level, on a workforce level, this is becoming really, really unsafe. So we've put together these five things. This is what the government needs to do. They're actually managing to ignore these things at the moment on the whole. Um, it's quite appalling to see. Um, but anyway, so they need to absorb additional energy costs for NHS workplaces. They have pledged to do so until April, but that's coming around very quickly. And the NHS has a funding hole at the moment. So that needs to be addressed. NHS staff currently have some mental health support, which was set up in early 2021. Um, we did a lot of work on this actually, and 40 mental health hubs were set up across um, the country. However, a lot more needs to be done. What we're hearing from staff is that there are waiting lists and that the mental health support they're being offered is very um, narrow. So it will be sort of a certain number of sessions when you come to the end of your number of sessions, that's it, and it's often not enough. So a lot more funding needs to go into that. Um, the next one is about budgets. So locum caps are, just to explain locum caps, just in case anybody doesn't know. A few years ago, the government decided to try and reduce the amount of money they were spending on temporary healthcare professional staff in the NHS. The bill was getting really high because we were understaffed. And so trusts were being forced to employ people on a temporary basis. Um, caps were brought in to limit the hourly rates that these staff members could earn because some of those hourly rates were getting really high. Um, the problem we have now is that the locum caps have come down so far that workplaces are struggling to hire staff to cover the hours. 
and of the staff body that they could be hiring from to do these extra shifts a lot of it is people doing overtime and unless you pay them properly they don't do the shifts um, we've heard recently of trusts which are in financial deficit who have tried to do things like half their locum caps even further so people are earning such a low hourly rate that then the department becomes unsafe to staff. Now, the government is just going to have to face facts. The We don't have enough NHS staff. Patients are dying. That's not me being um, <laughs> alarmist. Look at the statements that are coming out from people like the Royal College of Emergency Medicine about how many people are on trolleys. Look at any of the headlines about patients dying in ambulances outside A&E departments. We are in a situation where we need to do whatever we can to increase the staff numbers. And so those locum caps need to be done away with in the short term. People need to be paid whatever they need to be paid in order to get them to work. Um, also, um, GP services, the GP surgeries have to pay for their own locums out of their existing budgets. We don't have enough GPs right now. We haven't trained enough. We haven't supported and retained enough GPs. And so GPs specifically need to have a ring fenced budget for employing locum staff. Um, the next thing is <laughs> the Home Office have enormous backlogs in processing visas and other paperwork for the healthcare workers who are on visas. Um, the latest stat that I saw was that over a quarter of all UK doctors are people who are in the UK on a visa. Now, if people are applying for a new visa or to come into the country to start a job and it's taking them three months to get the paperwork together, that's three months that they could have been working in an NHS job. So that time needs to be shortened significantly. And a lot of it is simply administrative problems. It just needs to be sorted out. And finally, I'm going to allow Meg to explain this in depth, but we need to sort these NHS pensions out. Essentially, what we are hearing from doctors, senior doctors, is that they are cutting their hours within the NHS because they are being essentially charged to go to work unless they restrict their working hours significantly. It's absolutely illogical and nonsensical. And the doctors we're hearing from do not want to cut their working hours. They are doing it simply because they're receiving enormous tax bills for paying into their pensions. Um, it needs to be sorted out immediately. There's no excuse. Um, the government knows what's going on. Jeremy Hunt knows a lot about this issue already, but he's not taken any action on it. So I'm going to hand over now to our frontline doctors. I'm sorry, that was a real lot of information from me, but... Um, my takeaway from this meeting, guys, is really that we don't want to deliver this information and then and then for you guys to sort of absorb it, but go away and then there's no further steps. It's incredibly important that we up the pressure on the government to change these things. These are the only ways that we are going to make things safer in the NHS this winter. We're seeing things getting worse and worse and worse. And it's it's not on it's inhumane it's not the way the nhs was meant to be um so i suppose we're we're appealing to you we know that because you're here we we know you care an awful lot about the nhs um anyway i'm going to hand over now so meg do you want to tell us a bit about or maybe a little bit about where you are what you're doing and the pension stuff yeah absolutely thanks julia um i appreciate that pensions is not the sexiest of topics but but it is having a massive impact on senior um clinicians and nurses in in the nhs um i work at um, guys and st thomas's so i'm right across the um the river from from, from you guys um, i walk past westminster every day that i go into work um I'm currently working full time, 100 percent. But come January, um, I will be reducing my hours by 30 percent. Um, and the reason for that is entirely down to the pensions tax. I don't particularly want to do it, um, but I currently work full time and get paid full time. I then do a huge amount of additional work on top for free. But where I draw the line and where every other sort of senior clinician draws the line is paying to come to work. Um, I am not willing to do that. And so just as a little example for these aren't my personal numbers, but but this, these are the numbers of a, of a colleague. So he gets paid £100,000 um, in his gross in his NHS salary um, because of the pensions tax rules. He has received a bill of £20,000, a tax bill of £20,000 on that £100,000. So in his pocket, he's effectively £80,000. 
if he drops his hours in order that he earns £80,000, then the tax bill doesn't come into play at all. So he now has more spare time uh, and he's still got £80,000 in his pocket. And trying to persuade anyone that that's, you know, that, that, that opting for the first situation rather than the second one is the right thing to do is it, impossible. It's You can't sell that to anybody. And that's the reason that, that doctors are, are leaving. There are two issues with the pensions tax allowance. So there's something called the annual allowance. So that's how much my pension can grow per year before I have to pay tax on it. Um, that's currently set at £40,000. Interestingly, in 2010, so at the change of, of, of governments and when the coalition government took over and since then, that's been whittled away from £250,000 growth a year down to £40,000. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a, a tax grab essentially over that time. The second thing is the lifetime allowance. So how much my pension can, can grow cumulatively over my working years. Um, and again, that has been reduced that in, in 2010. That was just short of £1.8 million. It's now £1.07 million. So it's been reduced by close to 758 pounds What that's doing is um, affecting very senior doctors who are approaching their lifetime allowance a limit um, and are saying, well, actually, I'm going to retire three years early then, because if I stay on, it grows beyond the tax limit and I'll pay tax on it. So why would I do that? Why would I why would I effectively be paying to come to work? So senior doctors are, are leaving. The additional difficulty right now is that the calculation um, in relation to the annual allowance factors in inflation. And so where previously it's been very senior doctors whose, whose pensions have grown quite a lot over their careers um, who've been affected, um, now inflation is put into the calculation and I've got year one and year two consultant colleagues who've received tax bills. Um, and that's um, prime, all because of inflation. Um, there is nothing that we can do to control any of that. The only control that we have over it is how much we put into our pension pot each year. Um, and the only way we can control that is by working less. And so that's what people are doing. And that's what the problem is. The government knows about it. Jeremy Hunt knows about it. Um, Changes were made for the judiciary when this happened to them, for example. The reality is you need us, the public needs us, and unless some changes are made, people will just keep leaving. I don't want to cut my ass, but I will be doing it in January unless there is a change um, afoot pretty quickly. Thanks, Julia. Sorry, Megan, I wasn't sure if you had other things to say. Yeah, no, I'll stop there. <laughs> saying that that's really really helpful and Megan's not alone in this we're hearing this um from lots and lots of doctors and actually just seeing it Megan you're seeing it from a lot of your colleagues aren't you um so it, I'd it, say probably close to 50 percent of my colleagues um are reducing their hours um come come the new year um and and that, that's the same up and down the country um as I said we do loads for free and most of us don't mind doing loads for free because this is a vocation we care about our patients we care about about them being well we give a lot extra for nothing and most of us don't mind that but I draw the line and I know all my colleagues do at paying to come to work I'm not doing that I'd rather have the time and I'd rather have an improved quality of life and not pay to come to work yeah and also quite frankly we need people to be doing more hours not less yeah, exactly exactly and so so my my specialty is anesthetics and and therefore surgery and it runs on um particularly in relation to the increased waiting list, you you need to be persuading me to work more hours. I've always done it. Um, but people aren't taking those extra lists on now because that goes into their um, pension calculation and they just get, they end up effectively coming to work and not, and not being paid to come to work. So it's, it's absolutely perverse. The government has it in its gift and its power to alter the rules. If they don't, it will, nothing will change. You cannot, you cannot sell pay to come to work to anybody up and down the country um you know that that that's a that's a loss leader whichever way you uh whichever way you try and pitch it yeah okay fantastic right and um, megan thank you so much so we're going to be hearing next from is it maria speaking next i'm going to assume it's maria so maria is um a consultant geriatrician and she's up in Scotland and she's going to explain how things feel at work in the hospital at the moment, just to give you a sense of the pressure that the NHS staff are under and what patients are experiencing. Is that OK, Maria? Maria, you're on mute.
sorry about that. Sorry, Marie, you're still on mute, I'm afraid. On mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's perfect. I'm really sorry. I don't know what was going on. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for listening to us. Um, since we last spoke, I work in Scotland I'm a, uh, as a consultant uh, in general medicine and in geriatric medicine, and I do acute and selected take. I haven't seen any difference. Um, there's still people piling up in a &E, waiting for beds. Um, with patchy solutions to, to get them seen, to, to, to make sure they're safe. I don't know if you realize how unsafe it is for a medical patient to be waiting in A&E for a long time. Um, people think that they're in A&E and they're in a safe environment, but this is the farthest from the truth. Um, these people can be in a corridor, they can be um, in a trolley, on a trolley, um, or on a chair, not really in a bed. It's dangerous for their skin, it's dangerous for their mental health. If you are elderly and frail, it will affect your cognition, it will affect how you are living your disease. It's very distressing. Some people are self-discharging before they get into a bed because they don't re they realize they're, they're gonna be waiting there for longer and they can't take it. Um, and this is really not something we have to accept we have to fight against this happening. Um, the measures that we propose are good measures that would have an immediate effect in staffing levels and in staff morale. I think more than anything, they would show that there is a commitment from the government to, to continue to support the NHS because at the moment we feel that it is at the brink of collapse. And, uh, and I think it's very important for staff morale to know that the government is behind us, that they want this NHS to survive this winter, they want the NHS to get better. These are not the long-term solutions that we need, and for that those are going to be complex. They have huge ramifications into social work, into uh, you know immigration, into all sorts of things, but these measures will help now. Um, one of the doctors that is affected by the pension debacle, I was taxed for having helped extra hours during the COVID pandemic. And uh, my hours were 12 sessions uh, two years ago. They've gone down to 10 sessions. And uh, my financial advisor is recommending that I go down to seven sessions. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to my patients. I don't want to put this type of pressure on my colleagues this winter. But there might be one time when I will have to do it for my own, you know, for my own good, for my own good. Um, we are seeing patients and doctors that are under a lot of stress. Um, we're seeing doctors that have committed suicide in Glasgow and in Birmingham. Staff morale is really low and we need to support them. It's very difficult for a doctor to take the time off and go to counseling. Um, it's very difficult nowadays to even get appointments with volunteer organizations that offer counseling for doctors. So we need funding. Um, I think these five points are worth fighting for. As I say, even, even from, from a trust point of view, we need to trust in the government again. We need to trust that they have the will to support the NHS. These are people's lives. And we are accepting situations that are completely unacceptable in terms of patient safety. We have to do this. So I hope you take this on board and ask us any questions you, if you need to clarify anything. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And um, just to add to what Maria, I think sometimes examples can really help um, hearing, hearing sort of how this is impacting on people I've had a couple of stories, I say stories, it's not stories, it's information um, this morning from a couple of consultants, um, one of whom has said they had a patient in their A&E department, I don't think this is an isolated incident, I think this is happening repeatedly, but who 
an elderly person waited on a chair um, with a stroke for two or three days before they were moved to a hospital bed. And this is coming from a stroke consultant. They had assessed the patient, but there was nowhere for the patient to go. Now, can you imagine if that was your mom or your dad or somebody you knew? You know, it's it's absolutely appalling. And and it's not, you know, it's not what any of us expected when we joined the NHS. Um, it, it's really scary. I've also had a message this morning from a paediatric consultant who's told me about what's going on in their department. They've got corridors full of parents holding sick children. There's nowhere for them to sit. Um, staff abuse is going up, obviously, because um, patients are scared and they're anxious and they're, they're worried about their children. Um, she's told me that some of the patients are being discharged before they're medically well because the parents become so frustrated by the situation that they don't want to be in that situation anymore. And one of these examples involved a baby who had sepsis. So that's an incredibly high risk patient, uh, a baby who is three months old, who's been discharged from hospital by their parents because the parents feel the system is not safe. That is not the kind of healthcare we should be delivering in the UK. It's really really terrifying and it sounds like it's getting worse and worse she had a situation yesterday where they were struggling to get people's drugs in time so people weren't receiving the medicines that they needed to do um what happens on a ward is that a nurse t tends to put on a special outfit when they're giving out medicines and that is their designated task some of the most important things that happens on a ward but nurses are so um under so much pressure now and there's so few of them because we have so much understaffing problems that often nurses are unable to get those tasks done in a timely manner that, you know, the medicines need to be delivered when they need to be so that they they're effective. So these things are, um, are really appalling. And honestly, the messages just keep coming in. We run a forum of 25,000 doctors and um, my inbox is always open. I've had six messages from doctors this morning telling me how terrified they are for their patients. Um, Anyway, I'm going to move on now and hand over to Lisa. Lisa Naylor is a GP and she's going to tell us what's going on in primary care because primary care is under enormous pressure at the moment. And um, I think if you read the media, you would honestly think that GPs were not under the same pressure as the hospitals, but they are under extraordinary pressure. It's absolutely appalling. Um, Lisa, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, <laughs> Can you be, I'm hoping my, my uh, microphone's working. Thank you so much for coming and listening to us. I think, I think probably the overall thing to say is that this is a system failure, that our, our system, our NHS system is failing. And actually, this has been coming for a long time. You can't blame the pandemic. Things have been getting worse steadily year on year. Um, general practice is really, really struggling. We're struggling to recruit in every level of our business, not just our doctors, but our nurses, our fantastic team of receptionists, our administration and our managers. And partly that's reflecting, as we were just saying, the stress that our patients are under comes across onto our staff and the amount of abuse and complaints that we're getting are going up and up. A lot of this has been fueled by the perception in the media that we've been doing nothing for the last three years. Actually, I've never worked harder in my life. Over the course of the first 18 months of the pandemic, I worked above and beyond my normal hours. I worked evenings, I worked weekends, attempting to keep my practice staff and my patients safe in the face of what was an unprecedented set of circumstances. We saw patients face to face right the way through all the time. I didn't stop at all. It's the first time in my career that I've been worried that what I did would have a direct effect on my family because I was not having the adequate PPE what we had when we started was made kindly for us by a patient who had um, um, some equipment that he thought could make us visors so that's what we had um, and to be told that we've not been seeing patients we're not doing things properly we're not offering enough face-to-face -face appointments when league tables are produced offering that it just destroys what little morale is left I think I think all three parties in the last six months have said that they're going to make GPs see patients if necessary on the same day and def definitely within two weeks. The problem with that is that there aren't enough of us. There aren't enough staff. We were promised six years ago 5,000 GPs, new GPs. That number has never materialised and actually the number of full-time working equivalent GPs have gone down in the, in the last five years. If you think 
that is going to leave us with a deficit of probably between six to 8,000 GPs based on the fact that we needed 5,000 more in 2017. The effect that this is having on our staff, on our mental health, on our ability to care for our patients is massive. We all do this job because we're passionate about the NHS and we're passionate about our patients. I love my job. I love seeing patients. It's an absolute joy most of the time but it's really taking its toll on everybody. I have members of staff who've left general practice because of burnout and stress. I have people who are off sick because of burnout and stress. Um, it's very difficult for any body who works in the NHS actually I think to admit that they're struggling. We have a very definite attitude that we should get on with it um, and actually we're now getting to the point where we can't get on with it anymore actually it the the long-term effects of what we've been working with are massive the, the reason I'm saying this is a system problem is that there is a knock-on effect from what's happening in secondary care into primary care so those waiting lists of patients that are waiting for their hip or their knee operations they don't just sit there static waiting for any operation they have worsening symptoms they need pain relief they need help with their mobility they become increasingly frail over the course of time regarding requiring more and more input from primary care services we then end up trying to prescribe them medication which we know is going to probably cause them problems down the line because the most basic painkillers we use are addictive as well the other painkillers we use can cause kidney function problems and most of these patients have got are elderly and already have problems with kidney function and that then needs blood tests and regular reviews which increases the number of appointments that they're needing in general practice when i started in general practice i used to have um, a coffee break which was great we'd meet every morning we'd have a chat we'd all sort of see the day it was, it was still a stressful job because it is a stressful job that's what you sign up for you know that's what it's going to be we also used to have a lunch break that was quite nice too now I frequently don't have a coffee break I frequently don't have a lunch break I frequently don't have time to go to the toilet it's that it's that busy it is relentless throughout the day and I think that most of us are coping with it but when you see press articles like last week's article in the Telegraph listing the 10 worst practices for face-to-face -face appointments that doesn't tell you anything that tells you that that practice is not able to offer face-to-face -face appointments possibly possibly because like we've had this week you've got staff working from home because they've got children who have got covid so the children can't go to school so rather than taking time off and not doing any work they're dialing in from home whilst looking after sick children because they know that if they don't work nobody's going to see those patients and the knock-on effect is going to be on everybody else in the, bus in, in the business. I, there was an article yesterday uh, about a GP who's currently living in Cornwall but still doing two days of work at her practice. Uh, I can't remember where it was, I think it was in Kent and she's been named and shamed. They've put how much her house in Cornwall costs in the article. You don't know the reason for that I don't know whether actually what's happened, which is what would happen in our practice, is if one of my partners resigned, the chances of us replacing them is really slim. Actually, we've had jobs advertised for the last 18 months and had no applicants. What I think might have happened is she's moved to Cornwall for family reasons, potentially, but she's still trying to support her patient population in the only way she can, working distantly. But that isn't in there at all we are being demonized in the press as lazy and not working hard and it just chips away at your self-confidence and it chips away at the confidence and the mental health of everybody in the primary care team I'm really lucky I work with a fantastic group of people I have advanced nurse practitioners I have paramedics I have mental health nurses we have a really really good team but all of us are feeling the pressures at the moment the other thing to talk about is the energy costs. As with every other sector in the country, energy costs have gone up massively. A lot of primary care buildings are very old estate. They aren't eco-friendly, they aren't insulated. Many of them aren't particularly pleasant. I work in one currently that is not a nice building at all. And the energy costs are a business cost and that directly impacts on wages for the partners within the business and potentially impacts on the number of allied healthcare professionals we can employ. It's a really difficult set of circumstances that the NHS is under at the moment. 
with the nursing strike that's coming up, I dread to think what's going to happen actually in the hospitals. We are seeing increasing numbers of patients coming out of hospital too quickly, and that is not the fault of anyone in the hospitals. It's just that that's the only thing they can do. And we are seriously worried about patient safety. I'm, I'm really worried. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for explaining all of that. I really appreciate it. I think, guys, what it comes down to, none of this is a party political issue. Um, looking at this really, really frankly, we've got to think, what are we comfortable about as a country? Are we going to tolerate people dying because they're waiting for care? Are we comfortable with people dying in the back of ambulances? Are we happy with people dying in and on trolleys because they haven't got any treatment? Um, I'm not happy with that. I think anyone who isn't happy with that needs to come together now and really put aside differences. I do not understand why this government is ignoring this. Um, there, there are funding problems, the, the country's in deficit, we know there are problems, but people are dying and it's being ignored. It's terrifying, it's horrifying. I think the doctors that you've spoken to today, you know, they have to tolerate so much actually, and they have to go back into these situations day after day after day, that, um, that facing up to them is really, really difficult. And what we need to happen is for politicians to face up to what's happening, just take practical steps to sort it out. There are practical steps that could be taken now. So Hannah, would you mind going back to the slide just with our pledge again, so we could go back to what we think might help this situation. Thank you. OK, so practical solutions, the energy costs, like Lisa says, we need to have a pledge from the government that they're going to be extended, that the energy costs for NHS workplaces is going to be provided. That's a simple thing. It's just a budgetary thing. Um, the mental health support needs to be increased. That is a sort of slightly more ephemeral thing. It's going to take a bit more thinking about how to do that. But basically, the, the time frame for these mental health hub needs to be extended and probably their capacity increased. Um, the, the things that are the most pressing in terms of building the workforce right now, probably, which are achievable, is to sort out the pension situation. It could be done tomorrow. It, it's, a, it's not a difficult thing for Jeremy Hunt to do if he chose to do it. He knows it's an issue. Um, it's really, really important. It would stop senior clinicians from cutting their hours this winter, which is going to be directly impacting on patients. We need to sort out these locum caps. Just get them removed, get the staff in, pay them what they are worth um, and get a budget in place so that places like Lisa's GP surgery are able and are able to afford to hire locums to fill in gaps because they desperately need that support. And the admin problems at the Home Office have been ongoing for ages. That needs to be addressed as well. We've started to receive emails from some MPs, um, particularly Conservative MPs, who want to help us on the pensions bit and the Home Office problems. Um, but to my knowledge, um, things haven't really got moving. I don't have the sense that large numbers of MPs are um, speaking up about these issues yet. We would really like to assist you to do that, either individually or if a group of MPs came together to do this. Um, we're at your service. Please send us an email. We are at campaigns at everydoctor.org.uk. We can help you with further information, with testimony, with writing speeches, whatever it is you need help with. We're here and we can find a lot more information from the doctors in our network if necessary. Um, but these things need to happen now. And I know that I'm sort of talking at the people who've come to the meeting and I'm, I'm really sorry if I'm coming on a bit strong. Um, we're just really worried and I know you're worried too and it would be great if we could work together. Okay, so we're gonna go through the questions we've received in the chat box now. Let me just open it up. If it's okay um, with the doctors in the room, I'm gonna sort of hand these out to anyone <laughs> um, who seems the most appropriate. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Absana, for saying that. I mean, we can run these more regularly or send more information through about what's happening, um, if that's helpful. We'll be running more of these briefings. Does anybody have questions for us? Because I can't see any questions in here at the moment. There's, there's one from, from Myra or Myri, I'm, I hope I haven't mispronounced that, but I probably have. I'm just asking if um, pension discrepancies are a common issue in the NHS. I'm not completely sure what you mean by pension discrepancies. So do, do you want to just um, just highlight what you mean? And I'll, I'll do my best to try to answer that question. 
Hi, um, my name is Myra. I work for Absana Begum, the oh, member hey. of the Limehouse. I just had like um, just interest in um, like is this causing like pensions discrepancy? Like, are people basically not able to access their for are they having issues just even liaising about their pension? It's not so much accessing pension. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's all about the pension. It's all about pension tax, basically. Okay. All right. that makes um, sense, yes. So it's about it's about tripping over that. Um, so and, and what happens is that particularly in relation to the annual allowance, mm -hmm. um, the because inflation is now part of the calculation, uh, people will probably be OK for the last final. Well, we're OK for the financial year before this one. But, for example, I, I fully expect to get a tax bill for this financial mm -hmm. year. Um, I've got a bit of a little bit of leeway that will probably swallow up quite a bit of that for me and reduce that liability. But going forward with inflation at close to 11 percent, um, almost everyone who is probably 15 years plus in the mm -hmm. in the NHS as a doctor and also those senior nurses, too, will will trigger that. Um, and as I said, you know, no one mm -hmm. can make the elevator pitch to me to, to, yeah. to go to work. That's that's just a, that's a non-starter. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. No problem. Pleasure. I'd like to add just on something and it's that the HMRC um, sometimes are having difficulties giving us the information we need to make our own arrangements you know so I'm still waiting to find out exactly how much money the annual growth was da, 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 da. there's there's sometimes difficulties in getting that because I suppose they're <laughs> as well understaffed and overworked or, or whatever it is but sometimes we don't get the information we need on time I certainly didn't get it last year and I'm not getting it this year yeah and um, I think for a lot of doctors that it's the time that they knew that they had a problem is has just happened in that they've that people have got what we what everyone's calling the brown letter have you had the brown envelope yet yeah I got a brown envelope um so everyone's sort of had that coming towards the end of the end of the year um, and now people realise that they've got a problem. They didn't realise it before. So I suspect what you will see is is more and more almost a kind of an exodus, a part time exodus of, of certainly of consultants um, because of this very problem. Thank you, guys. Um, so, Roger Gale, I can see that you've got your hand up. Do you have a question for us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. No, I'm, because I, for some reason, the camera is not working. I, I'm not hiding, but I, I've been trying to turn it on and off. And it's not working. Um, thanks, Julia. A um, couple of things. I think, see that I think Peter Bottomley's joined us. There are, don't appear to be, sadly, very many MPs on the line, which is a shame. Um, there are a number of things that come out of this that I, I think we need to maybe go back over a little bit. Um, first of all, you've made the point, you're absolutely right, that we wouldn't be on the line at all if we weren't interested. Um, so take that as a given. I visited the local a and &E in, in my local hospital um, a couple of weeks back just prior to the opening of the new a &E into which millions of pounds has been invested. The fact of the matter is that even with the new facilities, there were probably 70 people waiting in one form or another in cubicles that were made out of bed sheets and God knows what, all. I mean, wholly unacceptable circumstances, from my point of view, plus people waiting on trolleys in the corridor, plus people waiting in ambulances waiting to be admitted. Now, a third of the patients in the hospital, I'm told, should this is this slightly gainsays what um, Lisa Naylor was saying, uh, are ready for discharge but unable to be discharged because there's nobody to send them to. Mm -hmm. That's a fundamental problem that I raised with the Secretary of State last week personally, face to face, and with a view to possibly looking at some sort of you know, whether it's Nightingale Hospital system or decanting system to move people. Um, down into. The problem, of course, is twofold. One, the Nightingale hospitals, for fairly obvious medical reasons, don't have lavatories because people in them were not able to go to the lavatory. So they were all bedpan cases. So there are no lavatory facilities in most of the Nightingale facilities. And second, it's a small matter of staff, which you've raised over and over again, and there aren't enough staff. So even if you created the, um, the Nightingale facilities to decant people into, You'd, you'd still have the problem of nobody to look after them. Um, and that is one hell of a problem that you can't address in the short term. Yep. I also visited very recently the um, fairly new facility at the University of Kent and Christchurch College. The facilities at Christchurch are absolutely superb for training young doctors. They, they are brilliant. They, they really are. 
um, arguably the conditions in the mock hospital wards are better than the conditions in the hospital ward. But those kids are going to be on stream when? In two, three years' time. Yeah. And may or may not then go into general practice. And I'm told that it takes another three years to train a general practitioner once they've graduated. So there's no quick fix there. Um, the two things that I think, and you've raised this, the two things that I think we can do something about at a parliamentary level across the House is one, the Home Office issue with visas. Because if we can't train, if we haven't got enough people now, then the only way we're going to plug that gap, please God, without rob robbing developing nations of their medical services that actually need them as much or more than we do. But the only way we're going to do that is to issue visas and get people, doctors from overseas into the country to bridge the gap in the short term. The other issue that I'm astonished nothing has been done about, and I'll have another go at this with Jeremy Hunt, um, because I know he's not unsympathetic, is the NHS pensions issue because patently if we've got a shortage of doctors putting them putting you into a position where you feel obliged to retire early is an absolute nonsense um but I would just refute the suggestion that you sort of made Julia that the government is ignoring this the government is isn't ignoring this um having spoken to both the prime minister and the secretary of state for health about this personally um, I'm absolutely satisfied that is not the case. The problem is, and even you, bless you, haven't come up, you've come up with the problems, but you haven't actually come up with the answers. There isn't a quick fix. Um, but the two things that might help are one, the, the visa issue, and two, the pension issue. And, and those are things we perhaps can and should be doing more about. Thanks. If I can just respond to that, we're an organisation that's set up in 2019, and we're obviously watching the situation very closely. We put up um, updated stats and we, you know, speak to a large network of people about the situation. It's been getting worse and worse, certainly for the last two years. And there are things that can be done outside of pensions and um, the home office situation, which would bolster the workforce. And the reason that locum caps are a problem and locum budgets are a problem, for example, is that if you think about this in terms of a body of healthcare professionals we already have in the UK, we have some people here and pensions are pushing them out of the workforce, but pensions aren't the only thing. Low pay is one of the things, lack of support, lack of recognition. Um, that's why people are leaving. That is why they're leaving early. That's why they're retiring. That's why they're moving abroad. Um, we need to support every single member of staff every single number of staff and not purely because we need to just get bums on seats we need to recognize that we have a highly trained specialized workforce the UK has some of the best medical training in the world the three doctors that you're speaking to in this meeting are senior clinicians and their experience is immeasurable we, we shouldn't be losing these people or treating them badly and in paying people properly you know that it's important to support people it's really important. Um, the government has been ignoring this. We know that because we ourselves have run about 26 MP briefings. So I've, I've sent lots of letters myself that have been ignored. We, we've get, got thousands and thousands of members of the public to send letters to lots of MPs who've ignored us. Um, the sort of the, I appreciate we are hearing from some Conservative MPs and we're really appreciating that. We know you care. And I know that you do care an awful lot actually Sir Roger Gale, because we had conversations throughout the pandemic on the telephone and things, but that's not, um, as, you know, I wouldn't say that's true across the board. I think there's been an awful lot of barriers to us reaching parliamentarians. Um, I think what needs to be recognised is that every single patient waiting on a trolley or waiting in the back of the ambulance or dying at home matters. And anything that we can be doing to improve the situation is valuable. And we have created the solutions. A, a, totally acknowledge these are not perfect solutions and the reason for that is that this government has not done enough for many years in terms of training and supporting the workforce but I'm not interested in in throwing mud at this point I'm not interested in laying blame at people's doors I'm interested in the practical solutions that are going to help as many people as possible at this point and I think we just need to think of everything that we can do and so that's what we've done that's why we've pulled together this list of five things. Sir Gail, um, sorry to, to come on like this, Julia. Um, Sir Gail, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm Spanish. I came here in year 2001 um, to work as a doctor and, um, and I love this country. And um, 
one of the things that when Brexit happened, obviously it was upsetting, but one of the things I was hoping, well, this makes sense. I was like, they were wanting to, to make low paid workers have better wages and have, um, you know, better jobs and not to make of low paid jobs a sort of slave trade, if you like. And I thought that was probably what would make the care sector work and that what would be the solution to the back door that you mentioned um it is the problem it is the big problem and the, it's a big problem that will have very complex solutions but we didn't see that happen the wages of these workers are still ridiculous so it's never an attractive career so nobody wants to work there they're in a benefits trap where it pays them more to to be not working than working um so so that has to be fixed and uh, I don't think the political solutions arrived when Brexit came. And that's what we're facing now. I completely agree. It's gonna have a very difficult solution, but there are solutions. You say about the Nightingale words, that might not be the solution. The solution might be to make of the care sector a career sector somewhere where people can go and work and earn a good wage and be recognized for the incredible work that they do. and uh, and. Uh, you know, get out of the of 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 the benefits trap and start working. Maybe the solution is to to look at the care sector and see how we can help them. Maybe we can give them tax reliefs. Maybe we can, you know, give them pensions. I don't know. Um, those are things to discuss at higher levels. But I don't think that this is a problem of the Conservative Party or the Labour Party. I'm in Scotland, the SNP here has made the exact same mistakes that have been made before. We just need to acknowledge them and try to find a solution because the problem now is that we do not have the healthcare. Not even the private sector has the healthcare to help us when we become sick. Um, we're gonna be let down. We're paying good taxes for a health system that does not deliver. And we don't have a private sector that's gonna be able to pick up the, the problem. It's not there. I work privately as well. It's not there. So I, we I have absolutely to... echo what Maria is saying about the private sector. And I say this to people all the time. There is no private sector waiting to swoop in and save everyone when the NHS fails. It's largely staffed by NHS staff moonlighting. Um, and it doesn't deal with most of the any of the expensive parts of healthcare. The private sector does not deal with them. So if you're if you've got a stroke, chronic diabetes, all those sorts of things, there is there will be nobody there to look after those patients. They will just die at home. And we have to stop that happening. We have to. It's not civilised societies don't and should not behave like that, whatever their political persuasion. They shouldn't. Megan, I agree with you entirely that it shouldn't be happening, but I don't know the quick fix that exists. No, I, I appreciate that and I don't, I don't think there is a quick fix. I the think as we've all been saying it's... The, uh... the idea that, for example, um, lifting the locum caps superficially yeah, might be a bit of a short-term solution, but what we actually need is not locums, we need general practitioners in practice. Yeah. As we do. Practice. Yeah. And we need to agree. Time, you can't yeah. just turn that round overnight. And if you raise no. the locum cap and you pay locums more, you're going to get fewer GPs in practice, but full time practice rather than more because people will just become locums. But the, the issue isn't, um, isn't exclusively with GPs. We, we do have a huge problem in primary care, but we also have shortages across the board in hospitals, in lots of different specialties. And, you know, we talk to a network of 25,000 doctors every single day and we hear the stories of what is happening and we hear the consultants who are told we don't have a junior doctor for you today. We don't have a team of three people. You need to come back in for the night shift because there is not a team. And the reason there is not a team is the junior doctor was offered half the rate that they would have usually accepted and so nobody has stepped up to do the shift that is simply the situation we are in it's not a primary care specific issue across the board I, d I have to say that from a primary care perspective actually the locum cap doesn't really affect us so I think and I agree Julia there is a massive issue in hospitals with junior doctors the the rates that they're offered to work the locum shifts they just don't want to work the locum shifts yeah. um 
and and I, I also agree there isn't there isn't a quick fix for this I don't think any of us think that you know this can be fixed overnight I think one of the things that we need to change is to make the jobs more attractive to people to encourage people to stay in this country because there is a mass exodus mm -hmm. of our junior doctors going abroad to work because the terms and conditions of work and the pay are better abroad and that's happening with general practitioners as well and that's where we get the knock-on effect when you are watching as a trainee doctor your senior doctors working like we do and feeling like we do you don't want to stay in this system and and I think that we need to change the narrative that's going on at the moment about how we're all working or not working and start to say this is what's happening in the NHS at the moment. This is the service that we are able to offer. Everybody is working very hard, but this is where we're going to go in the future. We need to increase the number of people we're training. The number of medical skill ca uh, places have been capped. There are lots of kids out there who want to be doctors, one of whom is my son. I've got no idea why he wants to be a doctor living with me, but he does. Um, and actually getting into medical school is incredibly difficult because the number of places are capped. We need to start investing in the younger generation to go through to the future, but we need to fix the pension issues in the older generation so we can continue to offer our expertise without costing us, which is what's happening at the moment. So I don't think there's a quick fix. I don't think any of us think there is a quick fix, but I do think that we need to start supporting, and it's not just the doctors, we need to start supporting our nurses, our paramedics, our hospital porters, our hospital cleaners. It's a system wide problem. Yeah. And and we need, yeah. we need like yourself, we need somebody to say, I, I worry, I see where the problem is and I support you. And it might be that you agree with all the five points, but you're gonna take two forward. Um, the the conservative shadow for health uh, here in Scotland, Dr. Sandesh, he's actually a doctor. He understands this. He took those points forward as well. It's not, it, it's important that we know somebody's taking notice because um, it's not just the press. We, we do feel like we're being let down. That's the feeling. And it might not be entirely true, as you say, but that's what we're feeling now. Just to be clear as well, this is a campaign that is specific for short term solutions this winter. We are aware that there are much greater long term problems within the NHS, which we do campaign on generally, but we're getting into winter. Uh, things are getting worse and worse. We're running this campaign as a group of doctors to try and make things safer for patients and staff this winter. And so these short term solutions would improve the numbers of staff working in the hospitals and in GP services. And that's what we're asking for. And, and as Maria says, if anybody feels able to help us on any or all of these points, um, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, what we would appreciate, I suppose, is probably for us to have further information. So if you could send us um, an email on campaigns at everydoctor.org.uk and let us know how we can assist you in your work. We really appreciate your attendance and for listening to us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time.